Okay, let's begin. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, staying the course. <laughs> Usually by this time, maybe 10% leave the, <laughs> the class. So um, good year that you're staying. We will continue our discussion on linear solvers. Uh, if you started your homework assignment, uh, you'll see that problems just result in simple linear systems. You use NumPy and Algebra Solve or A inverse, move on with your life. Most cases you are going to be dealing with are similar to those problems in your homework assignment. As you get near the end of your degree, more in your career outside the university, you will encounter larger systems. So that will consist of the next part of this discussion. When I was thinking, I was thinking today about, you know, every year I change topics, I add, I eliminate topics about what I want to teach in this class. And it occurred to me today from your perspective as an engineer who will be practicing numerical tools, who will be, there's no way around it. Whatever career you end up choosing, you will have to work with a computer, you will have to talk to the computer, you will have to do some data analysis. So numerical methods are fundamental or essential. But from your perspective, you need tools. You need to have just enough understanding of those tools, not as a graduate level understanding, right? So in my research with my PhD students, we dig deep into each method, we rip it apart, we understand every aspect of it. But my philosophy here in the class is that that's not necessary, that's not really what you're here for. In a way, I want you to be able to drive the car before you understand how the internal combustion engine works, right? You can drive a car without really understanding how an engine operates or a, or a transmission operates. Um, but you're engineers, you're not technicians, so you need, I need to hold you at a higher standard. And it occurred to me that as you proceed with your life, with your career, there are two things that will be important for you as you tackle problems. First, identifying what problem you're dealing with. So I give you the parachutist example in the homework assignments. Okay? What kind of problem is this? Is it an error analysis problem? Is it an, a partial differential equation problem? Is it a nonlinear system of equations problem? Is it a linear system of equations problem? Turns out it's a system of linear equations, right? So that's the first step, identifying what type of problem it is. And the second step is figuring out what is the best tool to use to solve that problem, okay? So those are the two things that you will see as, as an engineer. And from the perspective of linear systems, you have a tool now, linalgebra.solve, that solves any, literally any system of equations that is solvable, regardless of cost, regardless of complexity, okay? Now, you might need a more efficient method. That will be the second part of, of this lecture series. All right, so to do that, we need to dig a little bit under the hood um, to kind of get an overview of what solution methods exist for systems of linear equations. And you've heard me talk about direct solvers and iterative solvers. We will keep revisiting these concepts so that you have a cleaner understanding of what they mean. In general, when we are dealing with systems of linear equations that we write colloquially as AX equal BA is a matrix. So whenever you hear matrix, that's a system of equations. There are two general categories of methods. Direct methods and iterative methods. Direct methods are general approaches to solve any system of equations that is solvable, whether dense, sparse, whatever that means, tri triangular, upper triangular, lower triangular, tridiagonal, pentadiagonal, it doesn't matter. Gaussian elimination, for example, will work on any system of equations. Use the tricks of pivoting and whatnot, et cetera, but you will be able to solve system of equations. And the best part of direct methods is that they give you an exact answer. So they are an exact solution to the system of equations, except for round of errors because you're crunching numbers, okay? But that's the price we pay of using, for using computers. 
iterative methods, on the other hand, are more effective and cheaper for very large and very sparse systems of equations. Okay, why is that category very important? First, sparsity, which we will define later more quantitatively, but roughly a system of equations that results in a matrix that has a lot of zeros in it. So most of the coefficients in that system of equations are zero. So you have, you know, let's say you have five and you have 2x plus 3y plus 0z plus 0w plus 0q. And then you, have, you might have 0x plus 2y plus 5z plus 0, et cetera, 0, et cetera. So you have a lot of zeros in those, in those matrices. Those are called sparse systems. And it turns out that systems that result from ordinary and partial differential equations, when we convert them to solve them on computers, they always result in very sparse systems of equations. So they are ubiquitous in science and engineering. So they, they are a very important category. And they are large because like, if you remember the example of that fire simulation I showed you in the beginning, there's hundreds of millions of equations that we need to solve there. But most of the coefficients in those equations are zero. And so large sparse systems are very important. Now, if you remember the plot I showed you a few times, a few slides ago, well, let me see if, if ah. Seems like too far away now. Okay, if you remember that plot where I talked about the cost of Gaussian elimination versus the cost of some of the other solvers, for example, these, this, what you're looking at here is the solution of a very sparse system of equations. Very, very sparse. This is the Laplacian. The blue line is Gaussian elimination. It's, it's very expensive. These other curves are iterative solvers, which we will learn next, about next. So we need methods that are more efficient for these systems of equations, okay? So that's sort of the motivation for inventing iterative methods. Now, iterative methods are not exact. The idea with iterative methods is you start with a guess and use the governing equations to refine that guess and hopefully converge to a solution. Okay, generally these systems, they always converge and you pick a few hundred iterations and you're happy with a certain tolerance and you move on with life. You get a solution much faster than st standard direct methods. Now the choice of whether to use direct or iterative methods largely depends on the properties of the coefficient matrix A. So I came up with this diagram this year to give you more sort of a uh, um, lay of the land for what to use and when. So that is the second part of your methodology as an engineer. The first part is identifying what problem this is. Well, it's a system of linear equations. Okay, so what is the best tool to use for that system of linear equations? If the coefficient matrix is small, whether it's sparse or dense, it doesn't matter, just use a direct solver. What is small, that's relative. Today, small, 10 years ago, a small system of equations was 10 by 10. Today, a small system of equations is 100 by 100 because computers can deal with that very efficiently, right? Tomorrow, it might be 1,000 by 1,000, okay? You will be able to tell from your application if your technique is taking in an incredible amount of time, then clearly it's not a small system of equations. Now, if the coefficient matrix is large, if that system of equations is still dense, which a few cases it can occur in reality, some very complex regression systems with thousands or millions of variables, they can result in large dense systems. Then you would need special direct solvers like gradient descent or other methods. We will not talk about those here today. They're very complicated, these methods. However, if the system is large and sparse, there's plenty of zeros in the matrix, then there's two options. If the system is tridiagonal or pentadiagonal, very special cases, then there are very special direct solvers that are faster than any other method on the planet. All right? Otherwise, you just use an iterative solver. Now, within iterative solvers, there's a whole world out there. Okay? But at least you will know I need an iterative solver in that case. You just hop on and learn more about iterative solvers. I could spend uh, five years talking about iterative solvers. It's an entire discipline by itself. Okay? So what we will cover in this class is shown in red. We've covered... We've covered the upper portion, 
if the system is small, use a direct solver. Now, obviously, you can still use a direct solver anywhere, okay, in those, but next we're going to proceed to dealing with this, with the lower part. We'll take us a couple of lectures to finish this. Here's a summary of direct methods. Gaussian elimination, for example, is a direct method. Um, the algorithmic complexity was n cubed. So as the number of equations increases, the number of operations, the time complexity is, scales with n cubed. LU factorization, lower upper diagonal, you might have heard of, of this in, in high school or not, or in your calculus. Um, it decomposes the matrix into a lower upper triangular matrix, and then you can solve the system effectively. TDMA or PDMA, these are special direct methods for tridiagonal and pentadiagonal matrices. In a couple of slides, we will see the first tridiagonal matrix and understand why it comes from heat transfer. So TDMA stands for tridiagonal matrix algorithm, PDMA for pentadiagonal matrix algorithm. These are very, very efficient uh, direct methods. So they give you an exact solution. They are faster than the standard Gaussian elimination. Okay, they scale around order n log n, so they're more almost linear. And then there are fast Fourier, fast Fourier uh, solvers, fast FFT. Uh, that's kind of, it should be FFT solvers. They're efficient for periodic problems. Next are the general iterative methods. Their ap approaches range from very simple methods like Jacobi, which we will study in, in this course, to complex Newton Krylov manifold spaces get really complicated. We will not even get close to those multigrid methods, etc. We use those methods in, in computational fluid dynamics, but you know the first stepping stone is the Jacobi method, which we will learn in this course. Um, when do you use them? When it's faster to solve iteratively, typically for large sparse systems. Now, there's a special also situation for uh, using an iterative method in that the matrix needs to be diagonally dominant. And oftentimes, almost always, I guarantee you that if your sparse system of equations results from a physical process like heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid mechanics, um, thermodynamics, the, these systems are always going to be diagonally dominant. This diagonal dominance is directly derived from properties of the physics essentially. And what it means is that for every diagonal entry, the absolute value of the diagonal entry, that's AII, right, that's on the diagonal, A11, A22, or A33, etc. The value in the diagonal, the absolute value in the diagonal needs to be greater or equal to the sum of the off-diagonal components in absolute value, okay? So take one row, take the main diagonal, Let's say it's 4. The off-diagonal entries are 2 and 1. 4 is greater than 2 plus 1 on that row. Very simple. Okay. Oftentimes, if the system is not diagonally dominant, and we will cover this again, we're going to cover this in more detail, we do what's called pivoting. We rearrange the equations. Just move equation 2 to equation 1 instead of equation 1 and just kind of rearrange them, and boom, you get diagonal dominance, and then you can solve it iteratively. Okay. Now, before we get to iterative solvers, let's come up with, this, with a system of equations that is actually large. And that is not a thousand parachutists, you know, like the homework assignment, or two thousand parachutists. parachutists. I want something even more complicated, but yet easier to deal with. And that is going to be a 1D, one-dimensional heat transfer problem. Okay, so who's done heat transfer so far? Nothing. Okay, you've heard of heat transfer, right? It's like when you put your metal spatula, you forget it on the grill and you go and grab it and it burns your hand, right? Um, or when it's warmer outside, cooler inside, you go touch the wall, there's like some heat coming in, right? So that's heat transfer. We understand it intuitively. This is not a course on heat transfer, but I will wet your beak a little bit for what's gonna come next year. Next year, you will take a course uh, probably with Professor Powell, and you will learn about um, more in-depth about heat transfer. But I want to set the stage for this problem because we are going to revisit it when we get to ordinary differential equations. We need some system that is realistic, that's not kind of just like what you would learn in math. Here's an ODE, solve it. What, what the heck does that mean? Right? So this will be grounded in physics. You're not responsible for deriving the equation. Okay, I will give you that equation. I will give you the formulas. 
but I want you to at least try to follow with me to understand the physics and how the physics can translate to actual pneumatics. Now, I need to do a side note first. The same way that a first derivative can be approximated as f of x plus h minus f of x over h, okay? Now, notice what I did here. I put the x points on, a, on, on these blue points and I gave them numbers, indices, xi, xi minus one, xi plus one. And the spacing between the x va these axes, these coordinates, is h. It's constant everywhere. So f of xi plus h minus f of xi over h, that's equal to f at xi plus one, right? Because xi plus one is xi plus h minus f of xi over h. Just a simple nomenclature change as we build the complexity here. But we're familiar with that derivative approximation, rise over run. I will introduce now the approximation to the second derivative. Have you seen that before? Anyone seen an approximation to the second derivative? If you haven't seen it, this is the first time you'll see it, okay? We will come back to this and derive it using Taylor series by combining three Taylor series together. Taylor series of xi plus h, fxi minus h, and f of xi. You combine them together, you get the second derivative. This is the formula. Just like the rise over run, the formula for the second derivative is almost like the average, a weighted average between points around point xi. So it says fxi plus h, the value at the point next to xi, minus two times the value at xi, plus the value at the previous point, right? So there's a balance, f of xi plus one, minus f of xi minus, plus f of xi minus one, minus two times f of xi over h squared, okay? And this is just, this is just a formula, okay? It's just a formula. You're not responsible for deriving it, okay? I'll give you that formula. I'll tell you the second derivative is this. Just plug, plug and play. Okay, so let's set up the stage. Again, I'm trying here to can I circumvent a lot of theory to get to the point, but trying to make, make it as physical and as exciting as possible. So we are going to consider heat transfer in a rod or in a, in a block, okay, that looks like this. Um, and this is made of some material, could be copper, could be steel, okay, or even could be air. Could be, this could be the two sides of your um, drywall. Okay, outside and the inside, or a concrete block on the outside and on the inside. Each side, okay, so it starts, we'll start x equals zero here and x equal L over there, okay? And now the rod or this material is fixed, the temperature is fixed on either side. Okay, so you fix the temperature on the left and you fix the temperature on the right. You can do that by, like say it's being dipped in a, in boiling water and boiling oil, for example, at each side or um, up in the atmosphere, you maintain a fixed temperature outside, fixed temperature inside. So the surfaces are at a fixed temperature. And what we will do, we are going to introduce some heating inside. It could be a wire burning up inside your drywall. You know, hopefully not. Or it could be like a, um, you know, your grill lighter, you're lighting up something. Okay, so there's a fire. Here, there's some energy being transferred volumetrically to this material, okay? Could be outside it, could be inside it. Before you look at the equations, now, see how I changed the color here? Intuitively, you'd imagine if you're heating that rod, the temperature is going to go up in the middle, right? And it's going to taper off at the sides. We're assuming that the sides are at a lower temperature than the heating element. You're heating it to more than the surroundings, right? And that's kind of what it looks like. Red is hot, blue is less hot, okay? So that's the color scheme I'm using. Now the equation that governs this system, the equation that governs specifically the temperature inside the rod. So what if I ask you, I want you to give me the temperature at every point inside that material. So, okay, the outside temperature is 60 degrees, the inside temperature is 75, and there's some heating occurring in, inside that wall. What is the temperature distribution in the wall? Is it a straight line? Is it a curve? Like, how do you find that? Turns out there's an equation that governs this temperature, how the temperature changes inside that material. And it's called an ordinary differential equation, specifically, 
It's the heat diffusion equation, okay? Similar to diffusion that you're starting to probably learn in chemical engineering. It's the same process. It's something that happens at the molecular level. You know, the molecular mo molecules start vibrating and they transfer information to neighbor molecules and so on, okay? The equation is given by this fancy differential equation. If you've taken ODEs, you'll be able to identify that this is a second order differential equation in space for the temperature. It's second order because you have a second derivative for T. Again, I'm not testing you on those things. This is not a course on ODEs. But just, you know, familiarize yourself with this. You're going to see it. You've probably seen it. You're definitely going to see it in the upcoming month or next year. But this is it, okay? D2T by dx squared. It says that the second derivative of temperature okay, is balanced by this minus 1 over k times s. Now, s is my source term. That's the heat being generated in being passed on to this material at every point x. There's some value that I'm passing to that rod, okay? And K is what we call the thermal conductivity. So let's dig in a little bit deeper into what those mean. Okay. K has units or dimensions of energy over length times temperature, dimensions watt per meter Kelvin. Very simply, the thermal conductivity is the ability of a material to conduct heat. So you can tell if you put a wood spatula in boiling water or a metal spatula in boiling water, okay, which one is going to be hotter, faster when you hold it? The metal one, right? Why? Because it has a higher thermal conductivity. It has less resistance to heat compared to wood, right? So that's why you put a gap, you put double, double pane windows, and you vacuum them in between to reduce the thermal conductivity so that there is less ability for heat to be transferred. So a higher value of K means heat is going to spread very quickly across the material. A lower value of K means the material is going to resist heating. So now this, this rod is held at fixed temperatures on either end. There's heat coming in or leaving in one direction or the other. And then there's heat in the middle coming in that's kind of trying to spread both ways, right? So depending on the value of K, we're going to try to critically think about this and see what we expect. It might, you might have a bump, you might have a straight line, or you might have a flat line, okay? depending on that value of K. K is large means very quick transfer of heat. A lot of heat is being transferred across the material. Very small value of K means significant resistance to the heat. Okay, significant resistance to the heat. The source term, S, has dimensions of energy per um, cubic meter, per, per length cubed or watt per cubic meter. So volumetric heat generation. Now, the best analogy for this is the solar heat flux, you're out standing in the sun midday, you're being, you start getting, oh my gosh, like so hot, right? You're being exposed to about 1400 watts per square meter. So if your surface area is about, you know, 1.5 square meters, right? Or one square meter, you're being exposed to 1400 watts from the sun. So just to get a feeling of what this S means. Now, this is volumetric, so it's just essentially that surface flux being dissipated throughout your body or throughout the rod, right? So that fire, if it's outside the rod or inside the rod, is just going to volumetrically spread that rate of energy, okay, over the entire volume. But 1,400 watts is about, per square meter, is about what the sun um, um, hits you with every day, okay? Do you have any questions here? I know this is kind of beyond what you've seen or you haven't seen it yet. But it's as good an opportunity to learn about it. Okay? Great. All right. Now, to solve this problem on a computer, so there might be analytical solutions for this problem depending on S, and you know, there are solutions for that problem, analytical. You'll learn those in your DE class and probably never use them in your life. Okay? What we are interested in is taking these these problems, whether they have an analytical solution or not, 
and solving them on computers. Because there's going to be a point where later in the course, we're going to take this problem and come up with a situation where you do not have an analytical solution. Okay? So to solve this on a computer, we will subdivide the rod, the material, into a finite number of discrete points. Why? Because we're solving on computers. We don't have a continuous process. We need to have like x values, right, t -t 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 along the rod. This is called a grid or a mesh. When you put points on a, on a material, on a computational domain, we call that the grid or a mesh. And I will illustrate this example using five equally spaced points. Once we're done with that, we'll, it takes one slide to, to, to do the generalization over any number of points. Okay, because it will be just a recursive formula. So we'll do five equally spaced intervals, and we call the spacing delta x or h or delta x. Doesn't matter, they're used interchangeably. And we will place a point at the edge of each interval. So if you notice these dashed lines, they are the intervals. So I have five intervals or six points. Okay, it's up to you how whatever you want to use. Um, there's some mathematical reason why I said intervals and points, but use those. If I tell you put 100 points, then I mean those blue points, okay? 100 points means 99 intervals. Just does, It's not going to matter anymore after this slide. So I place these points equally spaced. The spacing between them is delta x. All right, so that's the procedure. Next, we will assign a temperature variable. Okay, so Bear with me. We will assign an unknown temperature variable at each one of those points. Remember, our objective is to find the temperature along the rod. We know the governing equation of temperature, which is the second derivative weird thing, right? The, disc the, the grid process tells us, all right, let's, let's try to do this. We're get, we will assign a temperature variable at each one of those points. So starting with the left point, I will call that T0, and then next point T1, T2, T3, T4, T5. So we have six points starting from 0 to 5. Okay. Now the temperatures on the edges of that material are fixed, so they're known. So I know that T0 equal some value, we'll call it TL for T left, and the value at the right hand side, at the right side of the rod is T right, so that's T5, that coincides with T5. So we know T0 and T5, then our purpose is to find T1, T2, T3, and T4, right, using the governing equation. Okay, so good with me so far? Okay. Next, you will later learn how to convert a continuous ODE to a discrete algebraic system of equations. That's, that will be the last chapter in this course. Okay, because we need to build up all that knowledge. We need to do linear systems, nonlinear systems, and finite differences to get to that point. Now, the process of converting a continuous ODE to a discrete version of it is called discretization. It comes from the word discrete. Okay? So we learned mesh or grid discretization. Right? For now, you should know that and I will give you this formula for now that for any interior grid or mesh point, I, for any point inside that rod, remember, you know the points at the back, right? So we're at the points in the middle, away, so T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on. The governing equation can be discretized as follows, and you might be able to follow with me uh, with this, but let's see how it works. So for any number of points, it doesn't matter. It could be five, four points or a million points. It doesn't matter. The formula is the same. You take this formula, you replace the second derivative with that approximation I showed you on the first slide. Okay? You plug it in here. You get, for any point i, you get a relation between the temperature at point i plus 1 and a relation, a relation between point temperature at i plus 1, i, and i minus 1. It looks like this. So we went from a continuous ODE to an algebraic formula. Now, we still don't know what Ti plus 1, Ti, and Ti minus 1 are. We don't know what they are. But that's the whole idea, is that if we write this equation at every point, 
we will get a system of linear equations that we can solve for all the temperatures. It's brilliant. So if you rearrange things a little bit, like I always say, put the unknowns on the left and what you know on the right, then there you go. You have an algebraic equation that is linear. And if you apply this at every point, as we will, we will see in a second, you will get a system of equations. So for example, for point one, I equal one, you get T zero, which is T I minus one minus two T one plus T two equal minus delta X squared S of X one over K. Okay. Same thing for point two and so on. Now I have not defined what S of X I means. So let's define that and we'll come and rebuild the system of equations together. Now each grid point has a coordinate, right? Because you are going from X equals zero to X equals L. You placed points discreetly between those two points, right? So you can assign a coordinate value for each one of those points. So for example, if L equal one, and we have five intervals, so delta X is one over five, X zero is simply zero. X one is X zero plus delta X. X two is X one plus delta X, which is two delta X and so on and so forth. X3 is X2 plus delta X and so on. So you can get all of those points, the coordinates of all of those points um, very quickly. In Python, you just do a lint space between zero and L. You put the number of points, it gives you all the coordinates, okay, very quickly. Okay, so here's the example for that. We did lint space the other day. We're gonna program all of this together, so, but I'm just putting the snippets of code here so that you have them in the slides uh, moving on. Okay, so for six points or five intervals, you just create a lint space from zero to L and you give it the number of points and it will generate all of those points for you. So this would be X0, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. Okay, so now that we have these coordinates, the source term can also be evaluated discreetly on the grid. So remember, in this case, the source term is given to you. It's like a Gaussian distribution or like e to the minus x squared. So you just simply apply it at each one of those x values and you get a discrete value of s of x at each one of those points. And we will call that si for simplicity. s of xi is simply the source term at xi or si for simplicity. So same thing. At every one of those points, you have a source term as 0, as 1, as 2, as 3, as 4 and S5. So for example, if S is equal e to the minus x squared, then S1 is e to the minus x1 squared, S2 is e to the minus x2 squared, and so on. And you know what x1 and x2 are, right? So to generate this in Python, you just simply pass the lint space to the exponential function. You don't do a for loop, Right? Because Python is vectorizable, like we did when we plotted sine x early on or when we plotted the exponential. You create a lint space, you pass that lint space, that numpy array to the function, it will create a function of those values. Right? So you don't have to do it point by point, you just do it in one shot. This is an example. The source term is e to the minus x squared. My lint space is the same as before. And simply, my discrete source term is the source function applied add the lint space. No for loops, no nothing. All right. So now that we have the source term defined, we can start building the system of equations. Okay. So for each one of those blue points, there is a linear equation that relates the temperature at two neighboring points to the temperature at that point, right? And so for any point i, point 1, point 2, point 3, point 4, there is this equation that governs it. i could be 1, could be 2, and so on. Right, so, so here, here's how it goes. For point zero, we know the temperature. That's given to us. The fo we don't care about that formula because it doesn't apply there. We have a fixed temperature. So it's given to you. That's a specified measurement. For point one, you get I equals Z, I equal one. So you get T zero minus two T one plus T two equal minus delta X squared S1 over K. What is S1? Is S at X1. Okay. All right. So let's go with point two. Again, I is equal to two. So you get T1 minus two T2 plus T3 equal minus delta X squared of times S2 over K. Now go ahead and do the remaining ones. Point three, point four, and point five. Work as a group, please. 
So let's see, do we have uh, the equation 4.3? Equation 4.3, you got it? Delta x squared, right, times s3 over k. That's right. That's what I got. So 4.3, again, that formula, i equal 3, just simply substitute the subscript. OK, do we have 0.4? Juliana. Uh, I have c3 minus 2c4 plus c5 equals delta x squared times s5 over k. s4 over k. Yes, sir. OK, perfect. You got it. All right, what about 0.5? Uh -huh. C5 Correct. That is the important point here. Pun intended, right? Yes, 4.5. That equation is irrelevant because you do not have a degree of freedom there. You cannot freely change that value. It is specified to you by the environment, by the experiment, by the user. Okay? And that's very important because. Those are called the boundary conditions of this problem. Okay, those are, when you study ODEs, they will provide a unique solution for this problem. Okay, so what do we do next? It's my favorite part. So we're going to write these equations now as a system. How many equations do we have? We have six equations, right? Two of them are known, so it's kind of a moot point to include T0 and T5 because we know them. But I include them in the system for convenience because when I solve it numerically, I want to be able to all just plot the result. So T0 equal TL in the system of equations is always going to return T0 equal TL. Okay, it's not going to. So I treat T0 as an unknown and I give it the right hand side equal TL. It will always give me T0 equal TL. Just a matter of convenience. Okay, so now what I want to tell you is not to worry about how these equations came about. I will give you that formula, ti plus 1 minus 2 ti, etc., or give you the recipe to build it, okay? And then you just have, but you have to apply it at every point and know how to build that system of equations, right? Remember that is step number one in your career enlightenment, right? In your career thinking. Identify what kind of problem you're dealing with, okay? Now, note the different form of the equation at the boundary points, T0 and T5, okay? So now, we can write this, these equations in matrix form, which is going to be your next activity. Uh, what is the size of the matrix first? Six by six, right? Six equations, six unknowns. Now, you're going to say, well, we know T0 and T5. Why are you including them as unknowns? It's just a matter of convenience. You will see the coefficient for T0 is 1, and the right-hand side is TL. So the answer is just going to be T0 equal TL. But I include it in the process because when I do numpy.linalgebra.solve and gives me an answer, I just want to plot the temperature from 0 to L, not just the interior, and then figure out how to add the endpoints, OK? So it's a matter of convenience. All right, so here's what I got. And again, I think about the matrix as the system of equations include that incorporates the coefficients of the system. Each row corresponds to an equation. The first row is the equation at point zero. What is the equation at point zero? Is T0 equal TL. OK, how do we recover that from the matrix? It's the dot product of this row with the unknowns vector equal to that point, right? So it's 1 times T0 plus 0 times T1, plus 0 times T2, plus 0 times T3, 0, et cetera, equal TL. Great. That's 1, T0 equal TL, right? Point 1, that is going to be this row. So I have T0 minus 2T1 plus T2 plus 0T3 plus 0T4 plus 0T5. Perfect. There's no contribution from T3, T4, and T5 to that, to that point. And that's equal to delta, minus delta x squared times S1 over K and so on, all the way to the last point, which is 1 times T5 equals TR. Now, when I run this through numpy.linalgebra.solve, it will always guarantee that T0 equal TL and T5 equal TR because it's a degenerate case. But I include them there because in my answer, I want to plot from 0 to L, not from point 0.1 to point n minus 1, if that makes sense. Okay, 
Now, what you should take from this is the pattern that you see in this matrix, which was invisible when we kind of looked at the equations individually. There's a pattern. You see there's negative twos on the diagonal, except for the first and last point. And there's ones on the first di upper diagonal and ones on the lower diagonal, first lower, except for those endpoints. And zeros everywhere. So that's the sparse matrix. And when you stretch this and make it a thousand points or a million points, you're going to get a lot more zeros. So let's see how this works. OK, so what you should take from this is what the matrix looks like. And in general, if we were to subdivide into n points, it doesn't matter. It's going to repeat 1 minus 2, 1, 1 minus 2, 1, move the diagonal, 1 minus 2, 1, move 1 minus 2, 1, and so on, all the way from the first point to the last point. So whatever number of points you put, that's what the matrix is always going to look like for this heat transfer problem. OK? Yes? Yes, so we, we'll get to that once we, once we understand the physics of this problem. We'll get to talk about the methods. Yeah, yeah. Have you done the TDMA? Yeah. No, just from what you've heard. Yes. Yeah, so we would, we would use that. We're not going to teach it this year, but I'll keep the slides in the, in the PDF if you're curious and the code for it. Okay, so when you look at this, you see that, yeah, it's just going to repeat. Whatever points you put, you're going to have this pattern, 1 minus 2, 1, 1 minus 2, 1, and so on. It's just going to be shifted one point to the right all the way to the last point. Okay, so, so this is nice because it's a systematic way of building solving this problem. I don't have to solve it for five points. If I can solve it for five points, I can solve it for a million points. I just need a mechanism to build this matrix. Okay. So let's see how. But first, what kind of matrix this is? This is called a tridiagonal matrix. Specifically, it's a banded matrix, but the only three bands in it are the main diagonal, first upper, and first lower diagonal, Okay, that are non-zeros, and everything else is zero. Excuse me, so this is called a tridiagonal matrix because of the three non-zero main diagonals. Main diagonal, first upper, and first lower. Okay. Now, for n points, what is the size of the matrix and the size of each of the non-zero diagonals? So I have n equations. What is the size of the matrix? So how many entries in the matrix? And how many entries in the main diagonal, in the first upper, and the first lower? Testing your linear algebra knowledge. So for six equations, we had a six by six matrix, right? Again, the matrix, for it to be well posed, you need to have same number of equations as unknowns. So for n points, that means n equations. What is the size of the matrix? And what is the size of each of the non-zero diagonals? So how many entries are in the matrix? How many entries in the main diagonal? How many entries in the first upper? How many entries in the uh, first lower? Just count the entries, whether they're zero or not. Just count them. So how many uh, is there? Is there 15? Is there n minus 1? Is there 2n over here? How many entries? Matrix size? n by n, OK. So, OK, we'll give a chance to others. OK, so n by n, I agree. Anybody disagrees? For six equations, we had a 6 by 6 matrix. Remember what we talked about last time for a system of equations to be well posed. The number of equations, the rows, needs to be equal to the number of unknowns, the columns. So n by n. If you have n points, that means n of this algebraic equation, we better have n unknowns, t0, t1, t2, tn minus 1, OK? So n unknowns. OK. How many entries do I, ha do I have on the main diagonal? n. n or n plus 1 or n n? Anybody disagrees? I agree. It's n entries. That's the diagonal. The main diagonal of, the, of a square matrix is the same size as the rows or the columns. 
Okay, it's n entries. Now, what about the first upper diagonal? You answered too many questions for us today. <laughs> thank you. So, okay, n minus 1. What about the first lower diagonal? n minus 1. n minus 1, thank you. Okay. All right, so I agree. n squared, total entries. Okay, so these, these are the number of entries in the matrix. Main diagonal has ent n entries, first upper has n minus 1, and first lower has n minus 1. Okay, keep that in mind, n squared, n, and n minus 1. Keep that in mind because we're going to use it in a few minutes for another activity. Now, this is also a sparse matrix. Okay, finally, finally, what the heck of, is a sparse matrix? Sparsity, the sparsity of a matrix, before we, we define what a sparse matrix is, sparsity is a measure of the number of zero-valued entries of entries in a matrix. So how many zero values do you have and how many total entries in the matrix? That's what sparsity is. So it's a ratio of how many zeros there is in the matrix relative to the size of the matrix. Now, a matrix is sparse if the sparsity is greater than 50%. In other words, if more than 50% of the entries in the matrix are zero, then the matrix is called sparse. So if the matrix has 16 entries and you have 10 zeros in it, then it's a sparse matrix. Okay? If it has eight zeros, that's like right at the borderline, right? Maybe you can call it sparse, maybe not. Okay. So in other words, if more than 50% of the entries in a matrix are zero, then the matrix is sparse. All right, so check this activity out, all right? For a general n by n tridiagonal system, tridiagonal, okay, tridiagonal system, what develop of a formula for the sparsity of a tridiagonal matrix. Okay, so don't forget to plug in the 100. Okay, what did you get for 100? What was the, the sparsity for 100 equations? 97? Okay, 97? 97% 97 of the entries in the matrix for only 100 equations are zeros. So here's how we do the formula. Okay, matrix size is n squared, total entries. Main diagonal has n non-zero entries. First upper has n minus 1 entries, and first lower has n minus 1 non-zero entries. So therefore, the total of non-zero entries is n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 1, which is 3n minus 2. Those are the total non-zero entries. How do we get the total of zero entries? That's the total matrix size minus the number of non-zero entries, right? So that's n squared minus that number, 3n minus 2. So that gives you the numerator, the number of zeros in the matrix, divided by n squared. Okay. For n equal 100, you get 0 0.97. In other words, 97% of the matrix is filled with zeros. Okay. Now, I don't have this on my slides, but I want you to consider what this means. 100 points is really nothing um, in practice. So to solve these problems accurately, you've got to go to 1,000 or 10,000 or a million points, especially when you go in multiple dimensions. Now consider storing this matrix in memory. And consider that for Gaussian elimination, you have to store the entire matrix, including the zeros in it. But the zeros fulfill no role at all. They're zeros, right? They have no meaningful value whatsoever. Yet you have to store them, but the matrix has 97% for 199% in most cases, all zeros. So you're wasting memory space for nothing, okay? So that has to do with space complexity when I defined algorithmic complexity earlier. That has to do with space complexity. I have some slides at the end of this chapter that you're welcome to look at where I do comparisons like a simple 3D heat equation with only like 32 grid points you, you consume 518 gigabytes of memory just to store the matrix. And that matrix, 99% of it is zeros. Okay, so there are ways, though, to circumvent that. 
Okay, so we're, we're not even close to solving this problem yet. We're just kind of just setting the stage, right? So we started, look what we learned just today, just today. Compare yourself right now to yourself at the beginning of this lecture. You learned, we took a differential equation, you learned about heat transfer, you learned about grid discretization, you converted the ODE to a, to a system of algebraic equations, you learned about sparsity, you learned about tridiagonal systems, there's a lot going on here, okay? If you're not excited, you should be, I hope you are, okay? Because there's still more. All right, so now we want to Pythonify this, turn it into Python. And we are not going to enter the matrix one entry at a time. One of your colleagues was doing that, and I told him, now do it for 1,000. He was like, no way, right? So we need a machinery to do it, because the matrix is the same. It's just got a bunch of minus twos on the diagonal, a bunch of ones on the upper and lower diagonals, right? So it would be really smart and cool if there's a way where we could just generate the diagonals and put them in the matrix. Right, because generating an array of ones is just simple. An array, make me an array of ones or make me an array of twos. Turns out that there's something exactly for that purpose in Python. Okay, so here it is. We need a mechanism to create these large matrices in Python. Luckily, most of these entries are repetitive. Except for the add, add end points, that's fine, we can fix it. It's more, the main diagonal is mostly minus twos except the eight points, the end points. So if we create an array of minus twos, and then just go say fix the first and last point to one, then you know we got it, and somehow put it into a matrix. So there's two steps to do that. The plan is to create non-zero diagonals as 1D arrays. So we create the main diagonal, the first upper, the first lower, as 1D arrays, just flat list, flat array. One, 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 or minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two. And then, the step two is to combine them to form the full matrix, okay? Step one, create 1D arrays for the non-zero diagonal. I sound like one of those announcers. Create, step one, create 1D arrays for the non-zero diagonals. Look at that. NumPy has a feature that does that exactly. It's called NumPy.1s. It generates a NumPy array that contains the value, guess what, one. Super useful. Right? Because if you multiply 1 by anything, by minus 2, by 5, you can get any other value, an array of any other value. So NumPy.1s, and you give it a number of entries, creates a vector, a 1D array of size n that contains the value 1 for each entry. So NumPy.1s3 gives you an array that contains 3 values of 1. NumPy.1s5 gives you an array of 5 entries, 1, 1, 1, 1. You don't believe me? Get your Jupyter notebooks up and running. Prove it to yourself. Let's do it. Okay, I'm going to create a new notebook here. And I'm going to say fun with NumPy arrays. Okay. So import NumPy as NP. Right, let me zoom in a little bit to the guys in the back. Give you a minute to load up. Okay. So my claim was that with NumPy.1s, I, I can create an array containing ones of any size n. So if I put n equal 10 and say mp.1s 10, it's just going to create an array containing ones in it. Okay? Pretty cool. Now, if you remember, the first entry in the main diagonal, let me move my slides here. The first entry, sorry, in the upper diagonal is zero. Everything else is ones, right? So we need to change, if I'm gonna take this array and rotate it so that it's an upper diagonal, I need to put zero at the first entry. And same thing for the lower diagonal, I need to change the la last entry. If I have a flat array and I'm going to turn it this way into a diagonal, I need to change the last entry. So let's do that before we turn it. Okay. So here's what I will do. I will call this u for upper, and that's np.1's 
10. And then I'm going to say u0, the first entry, is equal to 0. And then print u. Look at that. So I have 0 and then a bunch of 1s. I do the same thing for the lower diagonal. OK, let's use better names. Upper ud for upper diagonal and ld for lower diagonal. LD is equal also mp.1's 10 or n. Let's do n. And then for the lower diagonal, we need to change the last entry. What is the trick to change the last entry? Use circular indexing. Yeah, question. You can you can answer you can you can participate like in <laughs> you can answer any question. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to use negative indexing, guys. It's much easier. LD minus 1 is 0, and then print the lower diagonal, and you'll get 1s and then 0 at the last entry. So this really resembles those upper and lower diagonals, right? We just have somehow to somehow rotate them, okay? Now what are we going to do about the main diagonal? Simply... Multiply a numpy array of 1s by minus 2. It gives us a bunch of minus 2s, right? And also fix the first and last entries. So if you look at the main diagonal, it's all minus 2, except the first and the last one. So first, I will create a minus 2 times numpy dot 1s, which gives me a bunch of minus 2s. And then I will fix the first and last entries. So go back here and say main diagonal is minus 2 times mp.1s of size n. So if I print this, it gives me a bunch of minus 2s. Let's fix it now. md at 0 is 1. And md at the end, so md of minus 1 is also 1. And then I fixed the first and last values. Those are the boundary values, right? 1 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2, 1. So that's step one. Just create those diagonals as 1D arrays. Agreed? 1D arrays. Step two. How are we going to turn them? How are we going to turn them and put them in the diagonal? Well, again, the smart people at Python thought of all of that. They must have taken this course, maybe. <laughs> OK. All right, now step two, combine the 1D arrays to pull, to, to build the full coefficient matrix. Python has this function called diag, where it takes a vector, a 1D vector, and puts it on any diagonal on, the, on a matrix, any diagonal you so choose. The syntax looks like mp.diag v, k. v is your 1D array. K is the index of the diagonal that you want to put V on. The main diagonal is located at K equals 0 by definition. It's the main diagonal. It splits the array, the matrix in the middle. So it's located at K equals 0. The first upper is K equal 1. The first lower is K minus 1. The second upper is K equal 2. The second lower is K minus 2, and so on. Because you might have arrays where you have diagonals, like on the fifth upper and the fifth lower diagonal. Okay, so you can use this approach to do this. Okay? So let's try it out. I'm going to create a, a variable called A, or okay, mp.diag. Let's go to md, and I'm going to place it at 0. So now if I print A, it's just going to be an array full of zeros except the main diagonal. Look at that. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Now, the cool thing is you can do this for any n. If you put n as 100, OK, look at that. It creates an array, a matrix, with, with 100 entries on the main diagonal. 1 minus 2 minus 2 minus 2, 1. Doesn't matter. All right, so now we can go ahead and combine all of those together 
Okay? Combine all of those together to build the full matrix. But I made a mistake here. The size of the upper and lower diagonals needs to be n minus 1. Right? So, very simple fix. Let's combine those into one, line, one um, cell. So, let's get the lower diagonal and change n to n minus 1 for the lower and for the upper. And the main diagonal remains at 1. Okay. I'm going to delete this, delete this. And finally, we can combine them all together with three diag. So I want to put the upper diagonal using diag on k equal 1. So I'll do np dot diag for the upper diagonal and at k equal 1 plus np dot diagonal for the main diagonal at 0 plus np dot diagonal for the lower diagonal at minus 1. Ta-da! np dot diag creates a matrix full of zeros except for that diagonal you specify. So when you add them together, they just add element-wise. Okay? This should remind you of this matrix we have. 1 minus 2 is 1 in the main diagonal. And then on the upper, it starts with 0 and it's all 1s. On the lower diagonal, it's all 1s and it's 0 at the end. This is exactly what we get here. Is this cool? That's pretty cool. The best part is that you can scale it. You can put n equal 1,000, and it will just work. <laughs> it will just work. OK? Do 10. I'm just playing around here a little bit. Okay. So from matplotlib, you can also plot what a matrix looks like. Okay. There's a feature called matchow, show a matrix, and it shows you the non zero entries in a matrix. Okay. So everything in green is zeros. So that tells you about the sparsity of the matrix. It's a little feature that I like to use. You don't have to use it. Right. I think now we are ready to actually solve the problem. We might not have enough time, it's barely six minutes, so maybe this will spill over to, for next lecture. I have a warning, though, over here for you, that what we're doing here is not super efficient because we are still storing a sparse matrix as a dense matrix. We are storing all the zero entries. Okay. So it's not the most efficient way of storing a matrix. But for this problem, it's really, really cheap. So to me, a small system it is, is, is a thousand by a thousand. Doesn't matter. My computer can handle it in a fraction of a second. Okay? So it's not an issue, but bear that in mind. There's a lot of material at the end of these slides for extra additional material talking about how you store sparse matrices. You only store the non-zero entries and store an indexing scheme to, to find them, and it will save hundreds of gigabytes. OK. Finally, we can solve this problem. You think we're ready in five minutes to solve it? We're almost there because we built the coefficient matrix, right? We have the coefficient matrix. So what we need is the right-hand side and the spacing. Agreed? So for the source term, I will use a Gaussian distribution some coefficient alpha e to the x minus a over sigma squared. A in this formula tells us where that heat is located. If a is L over 2, it's going to be located in the middle. If a is 2L over 3, it's going to be located one-third from the right. If it's 1 over 3, it's going to be located one-third from the left, and so on. Sigma, standard deviation, has to do with how wide that distribution is, or how narrow it is. The larger the sigma, the wider that distribution is. Okay, 
Let's see. We're going to go to Python. And I already imported matplotlib. Okay, I will import my magic so that we can have clean plots. Okay. All right. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to define L. And let's say this is equal to 1 meter. Okay. For n, I want maybe 1,000 points, number of grid points. Okay. Now, the interval size, dx or delta x, is L over n minus 1. n points gives you n minus 1 intervals, right? So interval spacing, we have spacing, we have n minus 1 intervals. Like I showed in the slides, we can first thing we need to create is a system for the coordinate system, which is np.lin space going from 0 to L with n points. Agreed? So that gives us the point distribution. And if you're in doubt, print it out for a few number of points. So do n equal 10, for example, and print x. Then you will see start at 0, 0 0.1, etc., all the way to 1. Go back to maybe a thousand points. All right, so now we have this. Next, we need to define our source. So define source of x. It's only going to depend on x, our source term. Just x, nothing else. So alpha, here's, I don't know if I showed you how you can type uh, Greek letters. If you put backslash alpha or the Greek letter and press tab, it magically converts into a Greek letter. So over here, I'm going to put 1e to the 6. We'll play around with that number later. And then sigma for the standard deviation is equal 0 0.1. Let's say we will play with those numbers. And I will place the pulse at um, a is equal to 1 over th l over 3. Okay, and I will return alpha times mp dot exponential x minus a over sigma squared, right? So let me do squared and then sigma squared. Okay. All right. To verify this, you, we can just simply plot it. Okay, so plt dot plot, I want to plot the source term as a function of x. Oh, no. That's a little weird. Okay, what went wrong? E oh, there's a negative sign here. Okay, there you go. It's a pulse located where? At exactly one-third, 0 0.333. Okay. If I change sigma, if I put a smaller sigma, it will make it narrower. If I put a bigger sigma, I don't know if you saw this in stats, you should, then it makes it much wider, makes the pulse much wider. Suppose for now it's just 0 0.1. If you change the location of the pulse, 2L over 3 is going to put it on the right-hand side, or we can heat it right in the middle at L over 2, if you want, right in the middle at 0 0.5. Okay, I'm out of time.